So this is this is the 11 year old brain that I managed to source. Uh, so on the on my on my left hand side is a healthy 11 year old brain, and on the right on the right hand side is a malnutrited um, uh, malnutrited brain. And so and it's important that we sort of understand that trauma uh, impacts brain development very very significantly, and actually. Um, what happens is that the brain, as you can see in the left hand side, it's bigger uh, than the one on the right hand side simply because the, uh, the thick white line is there to, to is, is, is developed through abuse and stress and all that sort of stuff. So the, actually a uh, child of abuse actually has a smaller brain size that leads to further significant delays in de and significant key developments in their life. So when we look at the trauma in children or trauma in adults, trauma in developing brain, what are we saying? It's more than just behaviour. Uh, or are we actually seeing things that we examine the brains of those who have been traumatised? The slide that you, that you see here shows two cross-signal views of the brain on the MRR. What you see on the left is a normal 11-year-old male and the brain and the surrounding tissue in the skull and on the right you see a malnutrited 11-year-old male. What is demonstrated is the physical impact trauma on the brain. So this is a, this is a boy who's experienced physical abuse. This is caused not just by physical abuse, but through significant malnutrition and neglect. And a study done by Dr. Develis, um, he studied the brain of children who's abused and compared them to the brains of children who are not abused. Dr. Develis found that the brains of children who have been abused were different. If you look again at the left brain, there is a healthy child's brain. You see a thin external layer, so that really that thick white one you saw on the right hand side. On the left hand side, it was really, really thin, if you remember. The white matter, the white area arching over the brain image. And if you look at the image on the right, you see a thicker white band over the brain. This shows a trophy or shrinkage of the brain cortex, the cerebral cortex. Then, besides the cortex, the other structures, the hippocampus, which is lower down, is also smaller in size. If you look at the triangles, the black triangles in the brain, they are also called lateral ventricles. Lateral ventricles on the left hand side, they are small triangles, pretty uniform. On the right, these are extended triangles, much larger in this MIR image. So what you see here is the impact of trauma causing shrinkage in the brain. As the brain shrinks, the white covering the expand ventricles enlarge as well. This gives the credence to the fact that trauma and neglect impacts on a person's brain. And the impact is where the function and the form are interconnected. So the function and behavior follow the form changes. This means changes in behavior would occur with someone whose brain has noticeably changed. So that's a real, real, you know, scientific biological explanation of everything. But and that's a little bit out of my league. But I put that information in there because I just want to sort of paint this picture that when we work with children that've been abused or maltreated and they're going through all these really struggles in life. It just goes that they might actually not, they might be 12 or 13 or 14, but their brain really isn't quite re re representative, or their cognition isn't quite representative of their age. And often we put these great enormous tasks on people that you have to go to college or you have to go to work and you have to do all these things, and that's what normal people do. But what we find is that the stress and the anxiety associated with that actually complicates things for them so that they can be sneaky about it and sabotage and. They go around their own way of getting out of that sort of stuff because they're a bit frightened or they're not sure how to do it or they're distrusting of the process or they might not be ready for that sort of change. They might not be able to do the things that we ask them to do. So not only do we need to create a safe place where they can unpack all this, we need to be realistic in our expectations about working with young people who experience this sort of stuff and where they're at. So maybe we need to be uh, lower our expectations so that when we work with them that when they you know don't get something or they struggle with something or they're stressed out, maybe it's about us managing rather than them managing. Maybe we need to look at our approaches and go, what would work best in this situation rather than trying to get them to fit in or a certain therapeutic model or a certain youth work practice or whatever the case may be. I know in Maslow's hierarchy of needs there's these certain things like accommodation food and all that sort of stuff needs to be met. But how can we do that? effectively for these people, what sort of expectations can we have that's going to be okay to work with them, considering that they might not be fully ready to take on normal developmental sequencing. A researcher in Boston published a groundbreaking twin study in 2003. When she looked at twins 
who discord a trauma, one twin had a history of significant trauma and the other didn't. She found that the twin who had the trauma history had an, on average an eight point difference in IQ scores. The trauma was the only distinguishing variable in the lives of these twins. So as you can see, trauma is a significant risk factor for negative outcomes such as school failure, juvenile delin delinquency. Based on that, so based on that fact, 